Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jayduthi Hossein. I'm the president of the Duke Muslim Law Students Association. And I'd like to start with the Muslim greeting of Salam, um, it, which means peace. Thank you all for coming um, tonight for this really important and timely conversation. We truly appreciate your presence and participation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Duke Bar Association, uh, the law firm Baker Botts, and the Center for Law, Race, and Politics here at Duke. Um, I hope all of you were able to get a, um, a panelist bi biography sheet. Um, I'm not going to uh, introduce all the speakers for the sake of time, but please go ahead and look at that to um, get an idea of the background of our speakers. Now I'll pass the mic on to Professor Huckerby, who will be moderating our panel tonight. Uh, thank you, Shijuti. Uh, so my name is uh, Jane Huckabee. I'm the director of the International Human Rights Clinic uh, here at the Law School. And um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Law School to tonight's event uh, entitled Counteracting Islamophobia, Rights, Policy and Next Steps. Uh, before I introduce um, our panel and talk about the format for our discussion tonight, um, let me make a few brief and preliminary remarks about the context um, of Islamophobia um, in, in the current moment. Um, to say that the challenges of Islamophobia are acute at the moment would be a gross understatement. Uh, we have witnessed an election cycle um, in which those standing for office countenanced various measures to target Muslims, including surveillance and closure of mosques, a ban on the entrance of all Muslims into America, and a database to track Muslims within the United States. Uh, for example, in March of last year, Donald Trump said, frankly, look, we're having problems with the Muslims, and we're having problems with Muslims coming into this country. Additionally, there has been much talk of a Muslim registry. Um, the talk has been talk, has been very short on details, but it appears to be a shorthand for requirements to have immigrants from Muslim-majority countries register with immigration authorities, um, a program that is very reminiscent um, of one that was initiated by George W. Bush called NSEERS um, that targeted individuals from Muslim-majority countries and from North Korea, um, a program that was eventually scrapped. Uh, this week, in the administration's first week, we have seen three new executive orders on immigration. Uh, two of these were adopted on Tuesday, January 25, uh, one concerned was entitled Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States and essentially pertained to the removal of undocumented persons. The second was entitled Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States um, pertained to the wall, the building of the wall. The third, um, signed late this afternoon, um, is an executive order that is entitled Protecting the Nation from Terrorist Attacks by Foreign Nationals. Now, we haven't seen yet a formal copy, a finalised copy of that executive order, but we know uh, from the draft unofficial copy that it has essentially, um, that that draft um, had three core components. Um, the first of which was seeking to suspend the refugee resettlement program in the United States for 120 days. Secondly, and definitely suspending um, the admission of Syrian refugees. And thirdly, suspending entry by non-citizens from seven Muslim Arab majority countries, um, those being Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, and Somalia for at least 30 days. Um, it should be stated that even though that draft um, unofficial copy focused on regulating immigration based on the nationality of individuals, um, as opposed to a ban on those from a particular religion. Um, it has very much been treated by human rights advocates and immigration advocates as a distinction without a difference. In other words, the focus on countries is a proxy uh, for the Muslim um, ban that was talked about um, during uh, the election cycle. Um, it should also be noted that this week also saw the leak of a draft of another executive order, which has not yet been adopted, um, entitled Detention and Interrogation of Enemy Combatants. Um, that draft of that executive order, um, among many other things, 
um, employs the terminology of the fight against radical Islamism. Um, many will recall those, those were terms that the previous administration refused to utilise um, and have now um, found their way into a draft um, um, order. Um, that particular order also seeks the policy review and recommendations on reviving the CIA's secret um, detention and interrogation program. Despite these quite rapid and, and very serious developments, it would, however, be wrong to think that Islamophobia is either new or limited to political figures um, and their nominees for various government positions. Hate crimes against Muslims um, by private citizens have been on the rise, um, emboldened by the changed political environment and an environment which seems to sanction fear um, and violence um, on the basis of religion. And indeed, and as I have mentioned, this is unfortunately not new. While the scale may be different and the magnitude as we go forward may be different, um, for at least the, the past 15 years, um, communities and human rights advocates in the United States have been pushing back against both government-led and private citizen-led um, violence, harassment, profiling uh, on the grounds of religion or on the grounds of ethnicity as a proxy for religion. Against that backdrop in the current environment, there are ongoing um, efforts to develop the documentation um, of um, such crimes, to look at the legal and political challenges and opportunities for challenging Islamophobia, um, and really to ensure the human rights of all persons, um, regardless of their religion, uh, nationality, ethnicity, and gender. Um, as with any effort at any time, anywhere, to address hate and to address violence and to address human rights, it requires the mobilization of multiple stakeholders um, working through multiple frameworks, whether that be law, um, politics, fact-finding, reporting, and documentation. And to that end, this panel is a timely um, and important opportunity to really talk about those different strategies and what the opportunities are in relation to each, to each how they relate to each other, and the challenges um, in pursuing these efforts. Uh, to that end, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the panel. Um, as Shiduti mentioned, their bios are extensive um, and available to you already um, around the room, um, so I won't be repeating that. But we'll be handing over to, uh, first of all, to Professor Daryl Miller, um, who is a professor here at the law school, um, to open with um, some remarks. Uh, following the presentation of each panelist, we'll take a moderated Q&A, and so I encourage you to hold on to the questions that you will inevitably have um, for, for that moment of discussion. We, we will be leaving appropriate time uh, to do so. Um, also to note that we are recording the panel, but we are not recording the Q&A. Um, so please you know, feel free to ask the questions in, in which you, you want to like, during that process. And so with uh, that much more, I will now hand over to Professor Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? I've got a little bit of a cold, so my <clears throat> voice might be giving out. Um, so you have to excuse me if I interrupt my remarks by coughing or sneezing or doing something of the sort. So um, I think I would echo what uh, Professor Huckerby uh, has said. As I, um, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that certainly in my lifetime, uh, I have not seen um, so nakedly and on display uh, with uh, not even an ounce of shame or embarrassment the kind of appeals to um, bigotry and um, uh, ethno-nationalism uh, that we've seen in the past uh, election, um, nor have I seen um, uh, such a uh, reaction uh, by uh, the political, um, uh, our political leaders in, in their um, unwillingness to uh, s stand up and say anything uh, in opposition to um, this incredible appeal um, to the very worst um, of our instincts. Uh, and I say that having grown up in uh, Indiana, which was not the most enlightened part uh, of the United States uh, growing up. 
Uh, in just the last few days, uh, President Trump has suggested that uh, Chicago law enforcement needs to be less politically correct in the way they enforce the law, suggesting that he thinks that compliance with constitutional obligations of law enforcement is just some kind of uh, lefty uh, sentiment as opposed to a constitutional command. Uh, he's reiterated his belief um, that waterboarding and other forms of uh, torture are an effective means of extracting information, even though it would be a violation of both the United States Constitution, uh, the laws of the United States, and international law. Um, as Professor Huckerby has uh, uh, described, the recent bans on um, uh, refugees and immigration, um, uh, seemingly with this sort of broad brush uh, uh, that uh, simply because you come from a certain area, you couldn't possibly have a legitimate claim to uh, need asylum in the United States, um, no matter your age, no matter your gender. Um, uh, I think uh, I uh, keep coming back to uh, a remark by Lyle Leibowitz um, <clears throat> that a friend had sent me who said this about his grandfather in 1930s Vienna. And Leibowitz says this. He's going to treat, quote, treat every poisoned word as a promise. Treat every poisoned word as a promise. Don't normalize. Don't assume that it's bluster. Assume that it's going to happen. So that's the dark sense that uh, we're in right now. Uh, but I also have some hope uh, because I think it's fair to say as a teacher of civil rights litigation that um, we've seen this show before. Um, and the tools that are available uh, to fight uh, Islamophobia, to fight bigotry, to fight discrimination are far more uh, entrenched and far more available in 2016 than they were for the nearly uh, 150 years that African Americans have um, been subjected to uh, bigotry in, in the United States and longer. Um, so let me talk a little bit about these legal resources. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about, for example, hate crimes uh, legislation as well as uh, private um, litigation for violation of civil rights. Um, I'm sure that we'll gender a lot more questions, um, but we'll take those up at the end. So um, as Professor Huckerby has uh, remarked, uh, there was a spike in uh, hate crimes after the, uh, the election. Um, uh, the uh, genie had been let out of the bottle. People felt empowered um, to uh, do things uh, based on, again, their sort of worst instincts. Um, that uh, might happen, uh, but it doesn't make it any less wrong or any less a crime. Uh, so uh, on the federal side, um, there are a number of uh, uh, bias crimes uh, in the U.S. Code, um, including the uh, James Byrd and uh, Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes Prevention Act, and I'll go through a few of them. But in terms of the general points I want to make about these, um, these statutes, they usually require some sort of specific intent. That is, just because somebody happens to be uh, an African American or a Muslim um, or a Latino and is harmed doesn't necessarily mean there's a federal criminal violation. Uh, it has to be a specific aim to interfere or deprive the victim of uh, a protected right or a specific motive to harm uh, someone based on their religion or their ethnicity uh, or their race. So let me talk about a few of these. Uh, 18 USC, AUSC stands for US Code for those of you that uh, are not lawyers. Uh, Section 241, it's a crime for two or more persons to conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyment of a right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States. By the way, uh, many of the statutes that I'm going to describe here, like I said, we've been on this merry-go-round before, were actually enacted in the wake of the Civil War to protect freedmen who had just been 
uh, uh, freed from bondage um, with the 13th Amendment and the abolition of slavery. Uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 241 applies to uh, any person uh, and is generally understood to apply to whether uh, the person is a citizen or, or not. Um, the uh, effort to uh, injure or oppress uh, someone, uh, there ha doesn't have to be a knowledge of the victim in particular as long as the act uh, is used to threaten or intimidate such person. Um, and unlike some of the other uh, hate crimes or bias crime legislation that I'll talk about, there is no requirement that the U.S. attorney receive a certification from the attorney general uh, that such a prosecution take place. 18 U.S.C. Section 245, it's a crime by force or threat of force to willfully uh, injure, intimidate, or interfere with, or attempt to injure, or intimidate, or interfere with, and then it has a list of civil and social rights, including things like uh, going to a restaurant, riding on a bus, voting, serving on a jury. Uh, this uh, does require uh, an attorney general certification that such prosecution is in the public interest. 18 U.S.C. Section 247. Uh, makes it a crime to intentionally deface, damage, or destroy any religious uh, real property because of the religious character of that property, or to intentionally obstruct uh, by force or threat of force any person in the enjoyment of the person's free exercise of religious beliefs or attempts to do so. This does require the U.S. Attorney General certification uh, and has been used in the past uh, to prosecute persons for defacing or attempting to burn not only churches but mosques uh, and was one of the main uh, charges against Dylan Roof for killing um, uh, the African-American churchgoers in South Carolina. Uh, 18 U.S.C. Uh, Section 249, that is the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act. It makes it a crime to willfully cause bodily injury to any person because of the actual or perceived religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability of the person. Uh, the focus is uh, on uh, these injurious crimes that are uh, based on a hatred of a person's actual or perceived religion. So uh, as long as the motivation was because somebody thought somebody was Muslim, thought they were uh, from uh, Syria, thought they um, uh, were Latino, uh, that can be a crime. That uh, does require an attorney general certification as well. Uh, there is a state ethnic bias law. Um, it is not uh, nearly as strong in terms of the potential uh, criminal penalties, uh, but at North Carolina General Statute uh, 1440114, if a person shall, because of race, color, religion, nationality, or country of origin, assault another person or damage or deface the property of another person or threaten to do such act, shall be guilty of a class one misdemeanor. So those are um, the uh, kinds of um, crimes that um, the uh, 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 federal government and to some extent the state government can use to protect uh, persons um, who are Muslim uh, or perceived to be Muslim uh, from uh, bias crimes uh, in the United States. So what about <clears throat> private rights of action? I mean, what I've just described, of course, requires the involvement of a willing prosecutor who is willing to deploy resources uh, to fight bias crimes. Um, they will be at uh, the direction of uh, the U.S. attorney who might have um, other priorities, and certainly the Attorney General of the United States who might have other priorities. What kind of private rights of action are there? Well, um, the class that I'm teaching right now, and I think I see some of my students here, is uh, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. Uh, this is the basic um, uh, statute that permits uh, lawsuits against government officials uh, for depriving a person of, uh, depriving persons of any right secured by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Uh, so, um, you know, all the lawsuits that are filed against uh, police departments or police or municipalities because of deprivations of constitutional rights, that's Section 1983, which, as my students will tell you, again comes from uh, Reconstruction in an effort to protect freedmen. Um, usually from um, the acts of either the Klan or the Klan in coordination with local law enforcement. 
42 U.S.C. Section 1985. Uh, this applies to government agents or private parties. It is a civil version of the criminal statute that makes it uh, um, uh, uh, a person liable for two or more persons to conspire to deprive someone of equal protection of the laws and has been used, uh, for example, to challenge denial of permits um, for persons that want to build, for example, a mosque uh, if the denial of those permits were based on some anti-Muslim animus. Um, currently, there is uh, litigation uh, right now, and I think before the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, uh, having to do with uh, detentions of individuals, Muslim uh, men after 9-11. Uh, um, those are also being pursued against a sort of parallel provision uh, that comes straight from the Constitution, which is called a Bivens action. Uh, again, those are private remedies uh, that persons that who are harmed can bring a private uh, cause of action. Uh, Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that prohibits discrimination in any place of public accommodation on the basis of religion and national origin, as well as sex and race. Um, but since this is a panel in particular on Islamophobia, I'm going to focus on religion and national, uh, national origin. Uh, so... <clears throat> um, Public accommodation has a fairly uh, broad uh, sweep, uh, theaters, uh, restaurants, um, uh, coffee houses, uh, all these places um, are obliged uh, not to discriminate on a pers uh, against a person based uh, on their uh, religion or national origin. Uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination by employers uh, where the discrimination <clears throat> is a motivating factor uh, if it's on the basis of religion and national origin, again, uh, including race, uh, sex, and so forth. Um, that requires a filing. Uh, there's an exhaustion requirement. You have to first file a complaint with the Equal em Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, if they do not resolve uh, the case, then you get what's known as a right to sue letter, and then you can bring your own action. Uh, recently, in um, uh, 2015, um, in the Equal Opportunity Commission versus Abercrombie and Fitch, um, uh, a, uh, a woman um, who had been denied employment on the basis of wearing a headscarf at an Abercrombie and Fitch store was able to pursue her case uh, against the store. Um, on the basis that it violated her rights under Title VII. So um, that's about a little bit about the private rights of action. We can uh, talk about them during the Q&A. I do want to mention a little bit about um, the sort of looming issue about the Muslim registry, because um, the... Um, the issue uh, with the Muslim registry runs straight into um, one of the... Um, what's known as sort of the anti-canon, one of these sort of cases that has never been overturned but has been repudiated in all but name, and that's a case called Korematsu versus uh, United States. So in Korematsu, the president acting through the military after uh, the Pearl Harbor attacks and during World War II issued an order uh, that was implemented by the military requiring Japanese citizens in the West for no other reason and that they were Japanese to be sent to relocation centers. Uh, Fred Korematsu decided to stay in his residence rather than leave. Uh, in a six to three decision, uh, the court upheld uh, the conviction and said uh, that uh, the president during times of war has an extraordinary uh, amount of power, um, even as against uh, United States citizens. It is generally seen, it is generally seen as having been repudiated, uh, if not actually overruled by the Supreme Court of the United States. There has been um, all kinds of professions of, um, uh, by political actors of every stripe uh, that this is uh, a black mark on uh, the court, that this is a decision um, that uh, is um, uh, worthy as, of as much um, um, opprobrium as uh, the Dred Scott decision. Uh, that all said, it has not been overruled, and for those of you that are um, big consumers of um, cable news, uh, some people have been sort of floating 
um, the idea that you could do a Muslim registry against even United States citizens on the authority of Korematsu, um, whether we'll see uh, that, you know, uh, bridge being crossed again is something that I'm going to predict that uh, when um, the President of the United States says there's going to be a Muslim registry that we should be prepared to fight fight it if that's what it's going to be. Um, now uh, there are arguments that you know this is no longer good law uh, that in fact World War II and an express declaration of war by uh, the Congress uh, is a different uh, kettle of fish than what we have today, which is basically a delegation to the uh, president to um, prosecute the war on terror. Um, but um, that is something uh, that looms out there. So that's what the law can do, right? Uh, and I'll just finish with this, right? The law uh, is out there to act as a protection. What the law cannot do um, and has never been able to do, do is protect uh, you from the little indignities, right, uh, that go along with being a minority in America. Uh, the sense that um, you are a suspect, the sense that this isn't quite your nation, that other people don't treat you as 100% American, uh, that you are an alien in your own country. And what do you do about that? Well, there's no litigation that can fix that. But what you can do is get involved. If you're a citizen, vote. Uh, work on campaigns. Uh, get involved. Support people that are going to repudiate uh, this uh, dark hour that we seem to be in um, and uh, never accept this as being normal. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Miller. Um, we now um, have Durham City Council Member Gillian Johnson. Thank you, and thank you everyone for inviting me to be here tonight um, and for joining us here. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what I see as the role of elected officials in this particular political moment, and also about work that has been done in Durham so far to um, express solidarity and support for um, Muslim communities in our city. And ending with um, kind of an open question, which I hope we can address in Q&A, is what can we do going forward? How can we move our city from the symbolic, action, the symbolic to taking more um, concerted action? So I believe that the role of elected officials right now should be to model resistance and insist on the value of an inclusive community. Um, I spoke earlier uh, this afternoon um, at a rally at the CCB Plaza, which was held by a refugee resettlement agency called Church World Service in response to Donald Trump's um, pending and now um, signed executive orders regarding immigration from Muslim countries. Um, there were about 300 people who attended this rally, a number of whom were refugees themse themselves who spoke about their experiences living in refugee camps, mostly in Africa, being moved from camp to camp, from country to country for periods of many years, um, being separated from family, from their partners, from their children, um, and how these this new political moment here in the U.S., most of them were recently arrived, that it has everyone um, extremely frightened and really worried about the very real possibility of being separated from their families for very long periods of time. Um, we were then we then learned that Donald Trump had actually signed this order um, this afternoon, which several people have pointed out is on Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, which brings up this really bitter irony that the United States um, during World War II also refused to admit Jewish refugees from Europe for precisely the same reason that we are now claiming we cannot imp that we cannot admit refugees from Syria that Nazi sympathizers would infiltrate the refugee populations and then use their position here in the US to launch attacks on us um, so as Professor Miller said this is not new we've been here before um, and we know the result of this sort of callous disregard um, for human life. And so I'm hoping that as an elected official and as a member of this community that I can model 
a strong and moral resistance to this sort of bigotry um, and allow, allow space within our city government for, um, for a real opposition to what's happening right now in our country. Um, the Durham City Council has passed several resolutions in the last few years dealing directly with Islamophobia. In October of 2015, um, we passed a resolution supporting the settlement of Syrian refugees here in Durham. This was in response to a national conversation about um, stopping Syrians from entering the country, which was um, unfortunately jumped onto by then Governor Pat McCrory. Um, and he said that he would support a move um, to ban Syrian refugees. And so our response was to pass a resolution unanimously um, supporting the resettlement of Syrian refugees here in Durham. And we received an enormous positive feedback for that action. Um, lots of, of phone calls and emails from people who appreciated our um, show of solidarity. Then about a year later, so that was in October of 2015, um, in November of last year, we passed a resolution condemning hate speech, racism, and Islamophobia. Um, and we had, uh, at the meeting where we passed this resolution, we were visited by a really um, exciting and interesting um, immigrant Muslim man who gave one of the best speeches I've ever heard at city council, um, just really talking about his own experience and um, and really showing us the value of, of the symbolism. I come from an organizing and activist background, and so I feel like I often don't um, feel that these symbolic actions are that significant. I would rather, you know, do something that feels more actionable. But people have consistently come to us and told us that they do feel that Durham is behind them, that they feel more safe in this community, and that the, the value of these actions by the city um, is very strong in, in the community. Um, after the election of Donald Trump, my colleague Charlie Reese wrote a letter on behalf of the council, um, an open letter to the community, reaffirming that we believe that an inclusive community is our strength, um, that we will continue to support and protect our communities in any way that is in our power. Um, and we also received a lot of feedback for that action. Um, you know, since, since that time, as it's become more clear um, what Donald Trump intends to do and that he does intend, um, um, many people were saying before he was elected that they thought he would tone it down or that they thought he would somehow be stymied by the actual you know, office of the presidency and we can now see that that's absolutely not what's happened. That he does completely intend to move forward with um, such unjust um, laws as the executive order that he signed today or a ban on Muslims or a Muslim registry. Um, in September of 2016, also three members of the city council, myself, Charlie Reese, and Steve Shule, signed on to a national letter um, that was circulated by an organization called Local Progress, which is a national network of progressive local elected officials. And over 500 um, local elected officials signed on to this letter in a national campaign against Islamophobia, which was also in response, direct response to the rhetoric of, of the Trump administration. Um, so we, we've done, you know, a num we've taken a number of symbolic actions, which is, you know, primarily what is in our power, what is in our power to do. We are greatly constrained by the laws of the state of North Carolina, which, um, since y'all are all lawyers, I'm sure you know what Dillon's rules means, um, that because we are Dillon's rules state, we are not allowed to, um, do anything to take any action that is not directly authorized by the General Assembly. So in other states, um, the system is that you can't do anything that's not prohibited. In our state, we have to be explicitly allowed. So there are a number of actions that we would like to take, both on these issues and on other issues, that we are not, um, that we do not have the legal authority to do. And so that's been, um, that's been tricky in figuring out, you know, where, how is our role of elected, what is our role as elected officials in this moment? What can we really do to protect people in our community? Um, we are now finding a lot of people very concerned with the idea of sanctuary, um, with sanctuary cities and whether Durham can provide sanctuary. Um, because of our state law situation, we would be in violation of both federal and state laws um, in seeking to be explicitly a sanctuary city. Um, and so that is you know, more of a hurdle to cross um, with, with other folks on council than I think states who are only dealing with federal law and have state law on their side. Um, additionally, in October of 2015, the North Carolina General Assembly, Assembly passed HB 318, which explicitly 
I think before we were we were still prohibited by Dillon's rules, but HB 318 explicitly prevents any city in North Carolina from forbidding their law enforcement to collaborate, um, cooperate with immigration enforcement. However, there's no mandate for cooperation. There's, we just can't have a mandate against it. So there is not a state law that forces us to send our police officers out and collaborate with immigration in any way. Um, the city is gonna be releasing um, a press statement, which I hope is good, um, in the near future to deal with some of the concerns that are coming up in the community around sanctuary. Uh, but I was very inspired by a recent speech that I saw online by the mayor of Boston and the um, city council members in Boston stating very strongly that they will do whatever is in their power to protect their residents um, against this administration. And I hope that Durham can, to the best of our ability, um, follow in their example. So I think the biggest question for me and for everyone in this moment is what can we do going forward? How can our local government actually concretely um, support local communities. Um, and I think setting the tone is important. I think it's important that we have council people who are willing to you know, go to marches and go to demonstrations and really stand in solidarity with refugees, that every single resolution that I've mentioned tonight passed unanimously, every single council member is in support of these initiatives. Um, I think it's also important that we model good governance and we are seeing an extraordinary amount of terrible governance right now. Um, so to be accessible and open, to be transparent and responsive to community concerns and to, to provide, you know, to show people that, that government isn't all bad. And I think that right now we just have such terrible examples both on the state and national level that we see people really losing faith in our institutions. And so being an institution that people can trust and can rely on feels important to me. Um, I also think that it's important that the city directly challenge these unjust laws, either through the courts or through direct action. And a number of, um, you know, we have, we have several lawyers on staff with the city who I'm sure are going to be figuring out whether and how we can be involved in litigation as we move forward on issues that, you know, that directly impact and hurt our people and our ability to protect our people here in Durham. Um, and I also wanted to mention briefly how communities can and should seek help from the city. Um, we've had a couple of incidents of, of hate crimes since the election. We had a graffiti incident downtown, um, and we also had a graffiti incident in a city parking garage. We are very, very quick to respond to these things. So if anything like that happens, you know, immediately contact the city. All of our email addresses and phone numbers are online, and we also have a Durham One Call system, which is a number that you can call to reach the city administration at any time. Um, and if any other things, you know, any other issues come up, we are very happy and excited, and we really need to hear from community about what we can do for you and what you need and what, um, how the city of Durham can support you through, these, through this political moment. So please get in touch with us. Um, any sort of direct issue, you know, call, write. Um, we are very excited about working with everyone in Durham to, to really, um, to really value and honor and, and move forward with an inclusive community and, uh, and keep, you know, keep our people together during this time. I think that they're, you know, we're in a real, we're in a place where we're seeing a lot of. Um, exploitation of division. And I think what we want to do is make sure that we're setting the tone and setting a model for a city that values the contribution of every human being, that every resident of our city is welcome here, that refugees are welcome here, and that we model those principles in practice. Um, and I'd love to hear from anyone during the Q&A about what we can actually do, because I think we're all sort of struggling with that right now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, our final panelist is uh, Hamza Butler, who's creator of Project Mala. Yes. How y'all doing? Um, so I'm going to start with a quick prayer that I usually do before I give a talk. Um, I'll say it in Arabic and then I'll give the translation. رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. My Lord, relieve my mind and ease my task for me and remove the impediment from my speech so that they may comprehend what I am saying. So tonight, um, I'll be discussing, as was mentioned, Project MOLA, and more broadly how it fits into anti-Islamophobia activism. Um, but I think before that, it's imperative that um, to say that 
to accurately talk about Islamophobia is to first talk about the history of white supremacy. And to effectively combat it is to start from the furthest margins and to resist transdimensionally. And that is to say that our activism, or more specifically, our anti-Islamophobia activism, should be centered around helping the most marginalized and not the more privileged of us within marginalized communities. So to understand that our identities can intersect when we deal with issues of Islamophobia, we also may deal with issues that of gender, of class, of language, of citizenship status. So um, Project Mola is essentially um, a web-based application. Um, up on the slide here is just one of the pages for the info hub. Um, but essentially, it's a web-based application that um, allows users to report incidents of anti-Muslim violence. Um, it's particular in many ways. Um, but before we get into that, I want to discuss the tradition of community-based reporting that has informed this project. Um, for me, particularly, it comes from my experience as um, a black person in the US and the black liberatory tradition of community reporting. Um, of particular import is the legacy of Ida B. Wells. Um, starting, I think, 18, 1890s, um, after her paper sort of started, it went downhill, she began um, reporting on the lynchings of black men. And um, she said um, in, um, one of her writings that those who commit the murders write the reports, and hence these blots upon the honor of a nation cause but a faint ripple on the outside world. They arouse no great indignation and call forth no adequate demand for justice. Her tradition, while it began in the black press, it devolved more into a personal attempt to not only document, but to highlight that while there may be other institutions that document it, their interests weren't the interests of the most marginalized. And if you look more broadly at the history of the black press and like the first paper, the Freedom to Journal, I believe, um, one of their big points, um, the, the two founders, was that, um, that they wished to plead their cause. They too often found that mainstream media, where essentially things are reported, um, it, it skewed the reality of the discrimination that they were facing. So this was about returning to community and creating alternatives to existing platforms that could better express the reality of anti-blackness. Um, for tonight's case, of course, um, we're going to be talking specifically about anti-Muslim violence. And aside from the press and research that was done, there was also the oral tradition of just sharing um, experiences. and. Um, it, it just ties back to the reality that anti-black violence that came and stemmed from white supremacy created, or not created, forced black Americans, it forced women, it forced queer people to create their own alternatives. And in many ways, that's what Project MOLA is. So more specifically, Project MOLA is a web-based application created by members of the Chapel Hill Muslim community in response to the murders of Dia Yusun and Razan. Um, it typically serves as a counterpoint to the systemically supported notion that Islamophobia neither exists nor affects the livelihood of American Muslims and those racially, ethnically, and or religiously profiled as such. It's an act of resistance. Um, our primary objectives are many, um, but they're not limited to providing an accessible platform for reporting that allows users to not only report anti-Muslim incidents, but also retain such information. So on the report, that looks like filling out a form and then the user being able to download it so they can have it on file for themselves if they want to take some sort of legal action or to like have it for in the case of like they want to go to the news or something like that. Um, secondly, allowing access to the information that is access to information that is both palpable and interactive and speaks in the various topics related to the formation and reformation of Islamophobia. And lastly, documenting, analyzing, and analyzing the collected information so that communities may organize accordingly. We plan for the statistics and the analysis stored by MOLA to aid in filling the vast gap of unreported Muslim anti-Muslim victimizations, strengthen the collective consciousness of Muslim Americans, and to provide data for Muslims to organize appropriate safety measures. 
In the, open, in the application's opening statement, it describes Project MOLA as a defensive measure taken in hopes of preserving community, faith, and difference. And the key word here is difference. Um, and, and I'm saying this because part of what a lot of activists miss when they try to or they attempt to contextualize Islamophobia is that the reality that there's very real difference amongst Muslims. There are black Muslims. There are queer Muslims. There are Muslim women. And when we don't contextualize that complexity, we come back to this place where we're still stereotyping, even if it's a good kind of stereotype. <laughs> This idea of the model American Muslim, while it's not this flip side of like the terrorist bearded guy, it still fixes us within a, a framework that's incredibly limiting. And by erasing that difference, it erases our humanity. And um, that's where this, this idea of intersectionality comes in. It's a theory um, popularized and created by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and a lot of people use it. It's become a buzzword. It's really lost its potency. But essentially, it was a framework of analysis. And it, it, in, in her original um, writing where she released the term, um, she used it to analyze a number of legal cases. One of particular was Moore v. Hughes Helicopter, in which um, a black woman was suing this company for discrimination. But she was suing them as a black female, as a black woman. And the issue, um, the legal issue was that they were only going to pick one. They were either, she was either going to get, she was going to get damages or she's only going to get compensation for the fact that she was discriminated against as a woman or that, or because she was discriminated as a black person. They provided all these statistics and numbers and it completely erased the fact that her discrimination was very specific to her and that she was both black and a woman. And that brings a question to, as we were talking about anti-discrimination law, we, we constantly hear this race, um, gender, or we hear this or, or, this idea of breaking our identities into these fixed categories and not approaching the realities that we as humans are multiple things at once. And, and while we have cases of Islamophobia, there are also cases that are specific to Muslim women. So when they bring a harm to the court, are they no longer woman? Are they just Muslim? And it's about shifting our frame of analysis to something different that embraces this difference. Um, and the reality that violence can be compounded is central to answering the question, why create alternatives? And this initiative is about shifting our question from who harmed and how should we punish them to who was harmed and how should we remedy them? And it also ties into pushing back um, against the state by way of prison abolition and by way of um, law, uh, discriminate policing from law enforcement. The reality that there's a, a long history of like police surveilling Muslim communities or um, Muslims being indefinitely detained um, is to act, like, to act like those problems don't exist and to still engage with the legal system is not only it's not critical, but it leaves people in a position where they can only retain partial liberation. And partial liberation isn't, isn't any sort of liberation. It's not half a right is not a right. And I think that's vital. And what this site does, especially in the reporting component, is when we collect data, we collect data understanding that <clears throat> factors of gender, factors of sexuality, factors of class, all play a particular role when conceptualizing within the framework of Islamophobia. So um, I just want to talk about one example of how this intersection can occur. I know many of you probably heard of the incident at Abu Ghraib, where um, the detainees were tortured. That was largely framed as an issue of Islamophobia. But what people failed to, a lot of people failed to realize was that it was also a question of sexuality and how these men were abused. And because this wasn't framed in a way where these abuses were like pulling harms that were compounded or were, weren't involved with harms that were compounded, like the harm that they faced specifically 
by way of sexuality and when these, how these men were sexually abused was almost completely erased from the story. And it was just about, oh, it's, uh, they're treating them bad because they're Muslim and not because they have this perceived idea of their femininity or of their masculinity. Um, so going from that as just an example of how intersections can occur, um, uh, one question I get is what differentiates MOLA? Um, and one of the big things is we, we utilize what is called open source technology. Um, and this, this project is open source. And that is to say specifically that the coding that went into this, the design um, elements, everything is available open to the public. So we want to push this idea that there's always room for improvement. We want these to exist almost as silos in their respective communities so that like People could take the code, they may have a developer in the community, and they could set it up in their own database so people could report to that community, and that community leader has, or that community has their own rapport with its constituents, and it allows space for not only people to feel safe to report, but also for people to have a more intimate knowledge of what's specifically happening in their community. And hopefully with time, um, as people like take the, the code and take the designs, it will better and turn into something that um, could be implemented more universally across the country. Um, so moving forward, um, I really want to leave this Friday remembering that no experience of mistreatment is too small, nor any narrative of suffering unweighted. To engage critically with the world around us is our right, and to demand, just, and to demand justice is of our prophetic tradition. As Muslims, our existence is, and of itself, an act of political defiance against the products of Islamophobia. And our choice to speak out is a defensive measure taken in hopes of preserving community, faith, and difference. From the margins we resist, we are brave, we are aware, we are Muslim. We are Mola. Thank you. <laughs>